School of International Affairs. I took many courses on the question of the Middle East conflict. Semester after semester, we studied the Middle East conflict as if it was the most complex conflict in the world, when in fact, it is probably the easiest conflict in the world to explain. It may be the hardest to solve, but it is the easiest to explain. In a nutshell, it's this. One side wants the other side dead. Israel wants to exist as a Jewish state and to live in peace. Israel also recognizes the right of Palestinians to have their own state and to live in peace. The problem, however, is that most Palestinians and many other Muslims and Arabs do not recognize the right of the Jewish state of Israel to exist. This has been true since 1947, when the United Nations voted to divide the land called Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews accepted the United Nations partition, but no Arab or any other Muslim country accepted it. When British rule ended on May 15, 1948, the armies of all the neighboring Arab states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Egypt, attacked the one-day-old state of Israel in order to destroy it. But to the world's surprise, the little Jewish state survived. Then it happened again. In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan, in his words, to destroy Israel. He placed Egyptian troops on Israel's border, and armies of surrounding Arab countries were also mobilized to attack. However, Israel preemptively attacked Egypt and Syria. Israel did not attack Jordan and begged Jordan's king not to join the war, but he did. And only because of that did Israel take control of Jordanian land, specifically the West Bank of the Jordan River. Shortly after the war, the Arab states went to Khartoum, Sudan, and announced their famous three dubs. No recognition, no peace, and no negotiations. What was Israel supposed to do? Well, one thing Israel did a little more than a decade later in 1978 was to give the entire Sinai Peninsula an area of land bigger than Israel itself and with oil back to Egypt because Egypt, under new leadership, signed a peace agreement with Israel. So Israel gave land for the promise of peace with Egypt and it has always been willing to do the same thing with the Palestinians. All the Palestinians have ever had to do is recognize Israel as a Jewish state and promise to live in peace with it. But when Israel has proposed trading land for peace, as it did in 2000, when it agreed to give the Palestinians a sovereign state in more than 95% of the West Bank and all of Gaza, the Palestinian leadership rejected the offer and instead responded by sending waves of suicide terrorists into Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinian radio, television, and school curricula remain filled with glorification of terrorists, demonization of Jews, and the daily repeated message that Israel should cease to exist. So it's not hard to explain the Middle East dispute. One side wants the other dead. The motto of Hamas, the Palestinian rulers of Gaza, is we love death as much as the Jews love life. There are 22 Arab states in the world stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. There is one Jewish state in the world, and it is about the size of New Jersey. In fact, tiny El Salvador is larger than Israel. Finally, think about these two questions. If tomorrow Israel laid down its arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? And if the Arab countries around Israel laid down their arms and announced, we will fight no more. What would happen? In the first case, there would be an immediate destruction of the state of Israel and mass murder of its Jewish population. In the second case, there would be peace the next day. As I said at the outset, it is a simple problem to describe. One side wants the other dead. And if it didn't, there would be peace. Please remember this. There has never been a state in the geographic area known as Palestine that was not Jewish. Israel is the third Jewish state to exist 
in that area. There was never an Arab state, never a Palestinian state, never a Muslim or any other state. That's the issue. Why can't the one Jewish state the size of El Salvador be allowed to exist? That is the Middle East problem. I'm Dennis Prager. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see your beautiful face. I tell you what, we got some good looking people here. Huh? What'd you think about that video, huh? I thought you might like it. Uh, it's going to be incredibly relevant to our subject matter today. Before I jump into that, though, I've got a couple announcements. It's everybody's fun, favorite time of the morning, right? Announcement time. A couple things I have to mention, uh, which I'll mention every week. Please take advantage of the social media as a grassroots church. Uh, you know, we love free advertising. So if you haven't clicked like on the Facebook page yet, please do so. If you haven't shared uh, the stuff that we post on there to promote the church, please share that stuff. This video is uh, going live. It's going to be shared onto that page later. Please share that. Share, 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 share. All that good stuff. We also have an Instagram page that Stephanie... Uh, and Renee, Stephanie would normally be doing the announcements, but she's out of town. Uh, they do a great job running all of our social media, so please take advantage of the efforts that they put in to make this available to you to help uh, get the word out about what we're trying to build here in Delphi, okay? Uh, so Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. But beyond that, it gets confusing to me. There's Snap something or whatever. I don't even make these people funny faces. I don't know how relevant that is, but... In any case, take advantage of that, guys. Take advantage of the website, lifestorychurch.com. Uh, if you want to know what we believe and why from issue to issue to issue, please go there. Check it out. Uh, there's media content there, and you can also partner with us online uh, through online giving. Uh, even if you're joining us, I know we have people every single week that join us online. They don't have a church where they're, where they're at. They're, even some people are in some rural areas, even some other countries, and they join us online, and you can partner with us through the LifeStoryChurch.com website, so please do that. Also, I've got to mention coming up, guys, the last Saturday of this month, we have got uh, our men's breakfast. It's going to be the last one at Crum de la Crum. I'm sad to hear that they're going to be closing their doors. It's a wonderful place, so let's, let's uh, go uh, show some support. They're closing June 9th, so this will be the last men's breakfast. We do it at 9 a.m. the last Saturday of every month. This month it will be at Chrome one more time. So mark that down on your calendars, guys. Uh, and uh, with that, let's transition this morning. If you're a note taker, I see some pens out. You're going to want your Bible this morning, too. So if, you're, if you've got your Bible app or you're going to thumb through, I hear Bible pages turning already. I'd love to hear that. Uh, the video that we watched this morning is incredibly relevant because this is the name of our sermon this morning. Oh, so sorry. One more thing. Stephanie, you're going to beat me up for this. I forgot to release the kids. Little ones, you release the Sunday school class. May the Lord plant a seed in your heart that will reap an eternal reward. And all God's people said? Amen. All right. Where were we? Our sermon title this morning is simply this. We stand with Israel. We stand with Israel, church. Uh, Israel had a birthday this past week. Israel turned 71 years old on May 14th, 2019. It's a significant birthday for them for a couple of reasons, church. Uh, first of all, because the Jewish state, is, it means that they're thus currently in the harvest season following its 70th year. Jeremiah chapter 29, briefly. Verse 10 reads, After 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. After the 70th year, his visit would come. 70 is a big year for Israel. Historically, 70 is a big year for them prophetically and May 14th closed out that 70th year, officially putting them in harvest season. Second of all, the second reason that 
This is a big deal for them. 70 is a big, this birthday is a big deal for them. It's because every birthday is a big deal for Israel. 72 will be an incredibly big deal for Israel. Every single one, church. This was the week that Israel had leading up to their birthday last week. And I didn't know for sure how I was going to approach this and address and teach the significance of, of Israel being 70 and their birthday and, and everything that was going on. And it all just kind of compiled into this morning service. This was the week that led up to their birthday. 700 rockets fired at Israel. It's hard to imagine, church, we live in the United States of America, the most prosperous, safe country, probably in the history of the world. You live in a bad neighborhood in America, you're still safer than most every other country. In other countries, if you live in a bad neighborhood, you call the police, the police don't come ever. Right? This was Israel's week leading up. As a matter of fact, I found it interesting that the Huffington Post, which is a widely considered to be an anti-Israel organization and publication, uh, had another headline. Do we have that? They wrote an article about a couple that had been over there uh, visiting Israel when all of a sudden this, the sirens started going off and these rockets began to, to be launched into the area where they were. They said, we had 90 seconds to get the children to the bomb shelter. This was a psychologist who was on vacation in Israel, and he was shocked by how it truly affected them to their core. This is the reality that many, many people in Israel live with daily. When I was in Israel in 2015, we went on a tour. One of the places they took us was up, uh, up into the northern region uh, where uh, Hezbollah has over 10,000 rockets aimed at Israel at all times, and they brag about that. At any moment, we can fire 10,000 rockets. Each. Children grow up playing outside no more than 90 seconds from a bomb shelter, because when the sirens go, that's how much time they've got to get into a bomb shelter. I want you to try to wrap your mind around living with that in the back of your mind, in your subconscious. Every single birthday Israel has is significant, church. You know, I couldn't help but think, uh, I couldn't help but think of Israel's birthday and the celebration of their independence, the birth of the third kingdom, prophetic, historic third kingdom of Israel. Last night, did anybody go to the Bellevue picnic? I, I did. And even if you didn't go, if you were in Bellevue last night, I'm sure you heard it. Those fireworks were amazing. Um, they're probably the best fireworks show I've ever seen. Way to go, Bellevue Chamber of Commerce. Right? That was awesome. But I was standing there watching this, and I, I, of course I initially thought of the 4th of July, because I was like, this is better than the 4th of July. Good grief. What did this cost? I'm thinking, right? I think of our America's independence, and then I thought, you know, Israel just celebrated their independence as well. And this has just been marinating in my spirit. Last week when I was preparing my message, I was like, how can I not address the rocket fire? Israel? And the answer to that is I, I have to address it, church. I have to address it. This was a big day for Israel, and I do not want to let it pass without having a conversation that I think that we're due for as a church. You know, for several years, we, we planted this church, we started this church, grassroots, just a handful of us, over in a tiny room across the street in the Bellevue Community Center. And now God has flipped the switch and decided it's time that more should be able to, to, to join our fellowship. He's moved us into this building, enlarged our tents, and we're growing. There's a lot of people even in this room and people who count themselves as a part of us that aren't here today. But they're new and haven't had a lot of these conversations. So we've been talking about, uh, ever since we've been in here in January, we've been talking a lot about discipleship. We've been talking a lot about foundational things. Church, the issue of Israel is a foundational issue. And we have to address it. We're due for it. If you sift through the, the online content of Life Story Church, you'll find a statement that is bold, sadly, for the world that we live in. It litters all of our publications, and the statement is simple. It's this. We say it over and over again. We stand with Israel, but why do we 
as Life Story Church, want to make one of our pillars that we repeat over and over and over again this. Why do we say it so much? Why? Well, most churches stay away from hot button issues. There's a lot of drama wrapped up in this, right? Most, most churches won't spend a Sunday on what we're about to. And why is that? Is it political preference? Is it our, is our political preference? Is it for the social justice in all of it? I can't say yes, church, because it is so much more than political justice. Being on the right side of the Israel issue is so much more than, than social justice and politics. I can't trivialize the importance of why we stand with Israel, because it's personal, church. The issue of Israel should be personal for every Christian. So let's just dig in. I want to start, not necessarily where you think I would, if you're familiar with this subject, there are some scriptures where you might think I'm going to start in regards to why we support Israel. I don't want to do that today. We'll get there, but not yet. I want to begin, believe it or not, in Acts chapter 2 this morning. So I'll give you a second to flip your Bibles open if you're going to. Acts chapter 2. We're going to read a lot through there. We're going to read verse 22 all the way through 40. And then we're going to bounce over to Acts chapter 4. So you can put your thumb over there if you want to. All right. Acts chapter 2. What's the first thing that you think of when you hear Acts chapter 2? Most of us think... Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit came down, flaming tongues of fire, right? We're not going to start at Pentecost, believe it or not. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, but we're not focusing on that morning. Uh, uh, we're not focusing on that part of it this morning. What we're going to focus on with Acts chapter 2 this morning is what happened directly after. Directly after the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke with flaming tongues and fire, and all of the, peoples, the people in, in the, the city were like, well, how is this Jewish man speaking Portuguese? I'm here for trade, and he's telling me that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of all, right? People are getting saved, and just other languages, speaking, being, their, their native language is being spoken of. So the whole scene, right? Directly after that whole event is where we're going to pick up. Verse 22 through 24. Let's read. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Peter is speaking. Okay? I have found in my personal study, when you're reading Paul, when you're reading Peter, anytime they say, listen here, they mean it. They're saying, don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is for you right here, church. Listen to this, he says. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles. Remember, who is he talking to? Fellow Israelites. By miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Somebody say amen. amen. He is risen indeed. Amen? amen? Freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, or 32. Let's jump to 32 through 33. Peter, still. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of it. He's speaking in the streets, church. He's speaking to the Israelites. Verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Remember what just happened. The miracle of Pentecost. Verse 36 through 40. He said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified. That's tough language, huh? Both Lord and Savior. Nailed him to the cross, whom you crucified. 
He's made him both Lord and Savior. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Underline that. If you're underlining. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you. The promise is for your children. And for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's who the promise is for. Verse 40, with many other words, he then what? He warned them. He underlined this. He pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Powerful words. Power de powerful declaration of who Jesus Christ was. What happened, what God did for him, where God sent him. A powerful cutting of the heart, a powerful cutting of Peter's heart as he pleads with them, church. Do you feel it? It's so powerful, it's so moving. But I want you to look at a couple of things in the passages that we just read this morning. I want to show you something here. What does Peter reiterate? He re and I reiterated it myself a little bit in the reading. But Peter reiterates something. In verse 23, he said what? You nailed him to the cross. In verse 36, what does he say? He said, you crucified him. Speaking to the Jews. Make no mistake here, church. Peter wants the Jews to know that they crucified their own Savior. He wants them to know. As well, they should have been made aware as, as it were they weren't. How could the Jews do this to their own Messiah? How could they do it? Peter's furious. He's telling them, you crucified him. You did this. Ugh. How could they do this? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And you killed him. That's the sentiment. It's easy to get this thought in our minds when we're reading the passages. Of the Jewish people who hoped and longed and dreamed of the day that the Messiah would show up, and when he finally did, they killed him. Our Jesus, who loves me, who I know, and whom I love, they killed him. It's an easy thought to arrive at. And it's been visited and revisited over the centuries, and this is why I'm pointing it out here this morning, church, okay? As allegory was introduced as a standard to interpret scripture, let me say that again, it's a mouthful. Allegory was introduced as a means by which to interpret scripture whenever it was as early as Acts chapter 8 by Simon Magus and others in the first century. As allegory is introduced into the church for a means by which to Scripture or to interpret scripture. Anti-Semitism, church. Anti-Semitism has been a popular narrative for the purveyors of darkness. And they point to passages like this. Even Peter himself, you crucified him. How could you do this? Just our thought and our modern culture in this day and age. We love the Lord. We love Jesus. He's good. He's love. He's life. He's the resurrection. He's everything to us. And they, he was theirs and they killed him. How could they do it? Jews. And that, that natural instinct of wanting revenge or disdain, it enters into the human mind. It enters into our thoughts. As early as the 4th century, the church, quote unquote, began demonizing the Jewish people as a whole. I want you to understand something, church. Peter is speaking to the Jews. They were not believers in Christ. And he's saying, you crucified them. Why? They were the rabble in the street. They didn't know him. Once they knew what happened, they were cut to the heart. Peter thus then pleaded with all of the people. You know, uh, somebody who really had a heavy hand in crucifying our Lord and Savior was Caiaphas. He was a Jew. He 
And you know who else was a Jew? Peter. You know who else was a Jew? Jesus himself was, right? Anyway, as early as the fourth century, the church, the church, the Christian church, began demonizing the Jewish people as a whole. This is a quote from Constantine, 325 AD, taken from the Council of Nicaea on page 52. And truly in the first place, it seems to everyone a most unworthy thing that we should follow the customs of the Jews in the celebration of this most holy uh, solemnity who polluted wretches, having stained their hands with a nefarious crime, are justly blinded in their minds. Let me give you a little color here. They're talking about why they're going to make sure that the Christian church never celebrates Easter on Passover. That they never celebrate the resurrection of the Savior. They never celebrate the resurrection of, of Jesus on Passover when the first church actually did. He's talking about why they don't want to. And the number one reason is they want to make sure that they don't have any affiliation with the, the filthy rabble of the Jews. Let's keep reading. It is fit, therefore, that rejecting the practice of this people, we should perpetuate to all future ages the celebration of this rite in a more legitimate order, which we have kept from the first day of our Lord's passion, even to the present times. Let us then have nothing in common with the most hostile rabble of Jews. That is harsh. You know where that mindset comes from? It comes from how can they do it? You did this. Human nature always wants to point. Human nature always wants to find, uh, associate blame and assign it, always. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed that uh, when concerning yourself, if you do something wrong, you wrong somebody else, if that happens, you say to yourself, well, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't intend for it to happen. But if somebody else wrongs you, they don't get the same treatment. You don't say immediately, oh, I'm sure they didn't mean to, right? Now we're ready to assign blame. Always ready to assign blame. Anti-Semitism church has been prevalent since the first century. And here we have Constantine on full display saying, I have nothing to do with them. And you know, you know what happens? When I teach on the Feast of the Lord, the seven of feasts of court, how commemorative and prophetic they are. The majority of people in the congregations I teach to on these subjects have never heard of them. Why? Right here. They wanted to write Jewish tradition and custom right out of the Bible, even though the Messiah himself was Jewish, fulfilling Jewish prophecy. I get it now, don't you? We believe in Jesus and they killed him. That's the line that they want you to buy. They killed him. But there is a problem with all of that, church. And let's get back to Acts, and I'll show you the problem, all right? Acts chapter 4, verse 10 through 13. And then knowing this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of, Christ, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, again, here he is, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They just healed somebody. Right? I should give you a little backstory to this. Peter and John were seized because they were proclaiming the gospel in the streets. And thousands were coming to Christ and being saved. The whole scene from the, the flaming tongue, the tongues, speaking in tongues, all of that, the authorities, they seized them. They couldn't let this continue. They seized them and said, by whose power do you do this? And they said, by the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. But whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I could just take that one scripture and preach that. I could go completely off topic because... This one world religion, you know, it's on the rise today. It's on the rise today. But I can't go there. I'm just fantastic. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way, church. He's the truth. 
and the like. Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary, unschooled. What made the difference, church? They had been with Jesus. I have to point this out. I can't move on without pointing that out. How many of us feel unqualified for the task? How many of us un feel unqualified in certain relationships or friendships or scenarios at school, at work, or way wherever we feel like, ah, oh, I can't speak up. Who am I? I don't know enough. I don't know enough scripture. They've been with Jesus. And that was all the difference. Jesus is the difference maker, church. So application point here, screaming out, have you been with Jesus? Huh? Have you been with Jesus lately? And how much have you been with Jesus? If you spend a lot of time with him, it'll show and it'll pour out of you. It doesn't matter if you're unschooled. It doesn't matter if you're ordinary, church. Anyway, upon their release, upon their release, Let's go Acts chapter 4, verse 24 through 26. Upon their release, they go back, they tell everybody what had they return home and they report what had happened. And everybody in, in the room prays. Immediately they pray together. And that's what we pick up Acts chapter 4, verse 24 through 26. When they heard this, they raised their voices together. In prayer to God, Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And, oh my, church, do the nations rage? Do they rage against Israel? To the tune of 700 rockets, as a matter of fact, last week, right? Let's keep reading, though. 27, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. Here it is, church. Verse 28. Here it is. Don't miss this. Don't, do not miss this, okay? Verse 28. He says, They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. But they killed the Messiah, Constantine says. The filthy rabble and crucified their own Messiah. We want nothing to do with them. It's that thought, church. It's that anti-Semitic thought. It starts that simple. It starts that simple. Then it bleeds over into, well, they they missed their Savior, and I accept him, so now all of it, I must replace them. The replacement theology is born. Because why? We're interpreting scripture by allegory now. Now I can be Israel. Why? Because I accepted the Messiah. Now I get all of the promises of Israel. No, Israel is Israel. It's a country. You are not a country. You are not even Jewish, most of us. Also, the devil is a lie, church. The devil is a liar. Did they do it? Some of them? Yes, they did. Some of them. Those whom Jesus called of their father Satan, by the way. Did Peter call them out? Yes, he did. Does anybody remember from the previous scriptures why he did? And what happened when he did? Anybody remember from Acts chapter 2, 37? They were what? Cut to the heart when they realized. Then they repented and then they were baptized. When God shows you your sin, church, get this, okay? When God, because sometimes, sometimes we're in sin. Sometimes we have talked to ourselves and we have convinced ourselves to the point where we think we're not that bad off or we're thinking, well, the Lord may have this understanding. Right? I know people do it. You know, I know nobody here does that. 
But the Lord sometimes will use the Holy Spirit to show you your sin. Peter was calling them out to show them their sin. You crucified your, your Savior. That is a poignant ac accusation to receive, isn't it? If I'm told you crucified your Savior, you've been praying, you've been hoping, you've been dreaming for the day, and he finally came and you killed him. I want to I want to know that if I did that, right? That's what Peter's doing. He showed God is showing them their sin. Why? So they can sin, or so, so they can repent of their sin. When God shows you your sin, it's always for your good. It's never to rub it in. Peter wasn't just angry trying to rub it into the Jewish people. Like, you killed him. You're bad. No. It's for their good. He pleaded with them. The Lord gains nothing from the self-loathing of his children. He doesn't show you your sin and stick it in your nose so you'll feel bad about yourself and live in guilt. He gains nothing from you being self loving He would rather you repent and be made new, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Let's finish out. Let's finish out. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Did you catch that? Enable your servants to speak boldly now as they cut their hearts, as they repented, as they're baptized. Now enable them, God, to speak your word with great boldness. Verse 31, after they prayed, that was all just a prayer, by the way. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and they did what? They did. They spoke the word of God boldly. Thousands were saved, the church. They were both Jew and Gentile. Hmm. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, jumping back, jumping back, says something else about them, both Jew and Gentile. It says that all the believers were together and they had everything in common. The Spirit does that. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, unifies church. It doesn't divide. It doesn't point fingers. It doesn't assign blame and it doesn't rub it in your nose. That's not God doing that. Some of us do that to ourselves and some of us do it to people we say we love. So I said this was this uh, issue of Israel. Personal. When does it get personal? I said I would, right? Well, here it is. I picked another abstract verse for you guys this morning. So I want to come at this from a different angle. Back in the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 11, there's a dispute by a guy named Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. He was to inherit the whole kingdom, and as soon as Solomon died, Jeroboam led a, a a revolt, and it's a much bigger story. I don't have time to tell you. But the kingdom of Israel was split. It was divided. And it was divided because of Rehoboam's unfaithfulness. Allowed false gods, as Solomon did at the last. False gods into the kingdom of Israel. They didn't worship the Lord anymore. What they do, they would worship false gods. They would, they would fornicate to have babies that they would then sacrifice to demonic gods and idols. Child sacrifice was prevalent in Israel, and God punished them for it. And in doing so, uh, he speaks in 1 Kings 11, verse 31 to 32. Why, why is this relevant? Here you go. Then he said to Jeroboam, take ten pieces for you, speaking of the kingdom of Israel. Remember, twelve tribes. One is gone, Dan is gone. There's eleven left here. Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and give you ten tribes. This is just before the death of Solomon, before Rehoboam took over. He's speaking a prophecy to Jeroboam. I'm going to tear ten tribes. But, 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 and this is the crux of why I'm even reading this to you. Verse 32. 
But for the sake of my servant David in the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. Why did he leave him one tribe? Why did he leave Solomon and his son Rehoboam one tribe? Why did he not take it all? Why did he leave him Judah? For the sake of my servant David. Point? The point is this, Trey. God says, I made a promise to you, David, and I'm going to keep it. I made a promise to you, and I'm going to keep it as much as your son and grandson have let you down and let me down, as much as you have apparently failed as a father and a grandfather, I won't fail. Even though you, O oh Israel, have failed miserably, I will not fail you. It's an incredible lesson here. This is personal, church. Romans chapter 11. Let's jump there real quick. A little out of order for you up there. Uh, uh, sorry. Romans 11, verse 1 through 6. Read. Let's read. I, I, this is Paul. Jumping to Paul in Romans 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appeared to God against Israel? Verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him, Paul asks? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, the false god of receiving child sacrifices. Verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant Chosen by grace, verse 6, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were grace, would be no, would no longer be grace. This, all this, church, all of this is about God's love for his children. That's it. And how true he is to his word. If God is done with Israel, he might as well be done with you. He might as well be done with me. But he is neither done with Israel, nor is he done with you, church. His promises are still on the table. Many of his promises for Israel remain yet to be fulfilled, still to come. He keeps his word or he doesn't. It's that simple, church. Do you believe? Do you believe that he keeps his word because he either does or he doesn't? And I need him to keep his word. Oh boy, do I personally need him to keep his word. This is personal, church. He loves you. He loves you. He sees your heart. The Spirit pleads with you as it did through Peter. Always pleading. Always pleading. Pray for those that we love to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that it's only because of his kindness towards me that I walk with him. His kindness in the spirit is reaching out to all who would receive him. Acts 2, 38 through 40. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. You'll receive it. It'll seal your heart, church. The promise is, get this, get this. Don't, lose, don't miss it. Don't fall asleep on me on this one. Verse 39. The promise is for you and for me. Somebody, somebody read that with me out loud. The promise is for you and your children. I need it to be for my children. And it's for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Boy, is this generation corrupt. Oh, what? Boy, do we need saving from it, church. And there are so many people in Bellevue, in your community, in your realm of influence, church, that need it. 
I stand with Israel. I stand with Israel. There you have it. It's fine. Why do I stand with Israel? Because God loves them. He calls them his own, his children. He's made promises to them. Promises that they yet have come to pass, as a matter of fact. I need him to be true to his word. Why? Because there are promises for me. There are, God has made promises through the Holy Spirit for my children. <laughs> and he's promised to come back and with us. He's promised. He's promised to be with us even until the end of the age. Don't you dare think that you're alone. Oh boy. Israel is not alone. Israel, I wanted to show you that video this morning. A small nation state the size of, what do you say, New Jersey? And all this fuss. Right? Boy, it looks like they're outnumbered. It looks like they're outgunned. It looks like they're surrounded from every side. But they've got the God who created the universe in their arsenal. They are not alone. And you are not alone. That's why I support Israel. And that's why you should. I want to close here today. <clears throat> Promises are true. The people in this community that need to hear it, they need the Holy Spirit, maybe through you, to bring them to this point as the, as the Israelites were, as the Israelites were, when, <clears throat> when Peter said, he crucified him. And they showed him their sin, not to rub it in. Not to rub it in their nose, but to show them. Why? To lead them to repentance and thus salvation. There are people in this community that need you to show them their need for Jesus. Alright? So I made a, made a help wanted ad. We at Life Story Church, we're, we're hiring. Alright? We're hiring. The, the pay is eternal. Alright? <coughs> Got a help wanted ad for you here. We are looking for Life Story Church. Men and women wanted for a dis difficult task of building the Lord's church. This is the Lord's help wanted ad, I should say. You will often be misunderstood even by those working for you. You will face constant attack by an invisible enemy. Does it sound desirable yet? You may not. Here's the kicker. Are you ready? You're ready to sign up now. I know it, right? You may not even see the results of your labor, and your full reward will not come until after all of your work is complete. You ready to sign up? I am. I am. We'll close here, church. With every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're here this morning, I don't know, maybe you've never been in a church that took on the Israel issue and explained why it is we say we stand with it, I don't know. Hopefully, if that's you, hopefully you've gained some new insight this morning. But I hope the personal aspect of why we should stand with Israel, why we should stand on the Lord's promises, why we should believe that He is true to His word, why we should know that we're never alone as Israel is never alone. I don't know what the Lord is doing and how he's working on your heart, if he's working on your heart in any way, with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here this morning and you need to lay something down, you need to say, Lord, I cut my heart. Lord, you have showed me my sin and I cut my heart. God, I know it is not to rub it in. I know you don't do it to make me live in guilt. I know you do it, God, to spur me towards repentance and salvation. And so I give it to you, God. I surrender my sin. I surrender my guilt. I surrender my shame to you. If that's you here this morning, nobody's looking around. I just want to, only me, I'm looking around because I want to pray with you. Raise your hand. You can put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put it right back down. Thank you. Oh, he sees you right where you are, church. He sees you. If you're here this morning and you've never torn, rent your garment, cut your heart, you've never laid it down to Him, you've never asked Him to be your Lord and Savior, to save you, to be the Lord of your life, if you've never done that before, or maybe you've done, you've done it, but it was a long time ago, and you want to say a prayer of breathing in the middle this morning. 
that's you, raise your hand and you put it right back down. I want to pray with you. Thank you. You put it right back down. The angels rejoice with you even more. There's a party in heaven for you this morning. You know that. Let's pray, church. Say, with me, say this with me out loud, everybody. So everybody just say it together. Say, Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And that you rose from the dead on the third day. And because you live, I live. I believe that, Jesus. I believe that you're not done with me. I believe that you are not done with Israel. Come into my heart. Mend it. Make it new. To walk with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Church, may the Lord bless you. May He make His face to shine upon you. May He pour His favor out in your lives. May you walk in His grace and may you prosper in all you do. May the Lord bless the United States of America and may the Lord bless Israel. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.